Welcome to Typology and Prophecy. My name is Kyle. This is part one of a two-part series dealing with the typology of the New Covenant. Today we're going to be looking at the symbolism of the bread in the context of the New Covenant. Now when it comes to this topic, it has been my personal experience that when the New Covenant is invoked, it is most often done so out of a defense of liberties or indulgences that one believes are permissible because of the New Covenant. However, when it comes to doing theology, which by definition is the study of God, I cannot stress enough just how important it is that our language about theological topics be orientated towards God rather than towards ourselves. So what does that mean with regards to the New Covenant? It means that the primary purpose of the New Covenant is to reveal God to us in the context of the plan of salvation. It is not there simply to make permissible what was once forbidden by the Old Covenant. Now, while some of that certainly does take place in the transition from the Old to the New, we run the risk of missing out on the true intent of the New Covenant when we solely focus on the liberties and the indulgences of the flesh that we deem permissible. Look, let me clarify something here. When I refer to liberties or indulgences of the flesh, I am not talking about things a reasonable person would consider to be sinful behaviors. Of course, fanatics or unreasonable people can turn anything into a sin, but that does not in fact make it a sin. However, on the flip side, the point that I'm trying to make is this. Resisting fanaticism and indulging in legitimate liberties of the flesh, this does not itself equate to being under the new covenant. Look, not everything that is true equals the gospel. You can believe in gravity. That is truth. And it may even keep you alive by convincing you not to jump off the roof of the house thinking you're Superman. But it's not the gospel. Likewise, there are permissible things in scripture that are true, but they do not themselves represent the gospel. For example, let's say Christian A believes that he will be lost for drinking coffee, you know, because caffeine's a stimulant, etc. Christian B, on the other hand, rejects this idea completely and proudly declares himself to be under the new covenant and boldly drinks five cups of coffee per day in full liberty of conscience. While I agree with Christian B to the extent that making coffee drinking a mortal sin is absurd, It is, however, and nonetheless, equally absurd to argue that drinking coffee, or fill in the blank with whatever indulgence you prefer, is somehow an evidence of being under the new covenant. Now, when it comes to people who have a tendency to do this, meaning they elevate fleshly liberties up to the status of being the new covenant, most of the time this is coming from a place of anti-legalism. Many of these people have suffered trauma from the horrible effects of attempting to live out a legalistic, works-based approach to salvation. Unfortunately, when the pendulum swings to the other extreme, the focus is still on matters of the flesh rather than on the true spiritual revelation of the new covenant. And look, I get it. It can feel almost euphoric to finally have the weight of legalism lifted off your shoulders. Because of this, it can be easy to reason that if it looks like the good news, if it sounds like the good news, and it feels like the good news, then it must therefore be the good news, right? Well, not so much. And I know this is going to be hard to hear for those who find themselves in this boat, but Jesus did not come to save us from legalism. Praise God if he does, just like praise God when he delivers us from being an alcoholic. But Adam and Eve were not cast out of the garden because they were legalists or because they were alcoholics. They were cast out because they were sinners, and the penalty for sin is death. Simply not being a legalist does not resolve the issue of sin and death. Please understand this. I'm not trying to take away anyone's liberties, but I am trying to point out that Christ did not die to simply give us liberty of conscience in matters of the flesh. 
Rather, God became a man and died on the cross to save us from sin and death. And yes, even non-legalists require saving from sin and death. Now, that process may include removing legalism out of our lives, like it may include removing drugs and alcohol out of our lives as well, because both can be a hindrance to the gospel. But we should never think that the mere absence of legalism is itself the gospel. Perhaps it is the fruit of the gospel in our lives, but it is not the gospel itself. Why? Because God himself is the good news, not the liberties we enjoy because we escape from legalism. When Jesus explained why he will reject those who call out to him saying, Lord, Lord, the reason he gave is not that they were too legalistic or that they didn't indulge in enough liberties. No, rather what he said is, depart from me, I never knew you. Again, God himself is the good news. And being under grace requires that we know God and are known by him. We simply cannot equate the revelation of God, i.e. the gospel, with petty matters of the flesh. Nor can we, by the way, continue to accuse everyone of being a legalist simply for not indulging in every liberty we deem permissible. So, with that being said, what I want to do in this series is show that the three primary symbols of the New Covenant, that they are all symbolic of God himself, and that each reveal an aspect of God's involvement in the act of saving us from sin and death. This is how we orientate our language about the New Covenant towards God, rather than towards matters of only fleshly importance. In this episode, we're going to be dealing with the symbol of the bread, which Christ introduced during the Lord's Supper. Now, the account of the Lord's Supper is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We'll be reading from Matthew's account. In chapter 26 and in verse 26 we read, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now there is no uncertainty here as to what the bread represents. Christ tells us plainly that the bread is a symbol of his body. Now, this is not the first time that Christ has made this comparison between bread and his body. There's a discourse found in John chapter 6 where Jesus states, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So just to reiterate, at the Lord's Supper, Jesus says the bread represents his body, and here in John chapter 6, he says the bread represents his flesh. So now that we have shown the connection between the Lord's Supper and this discourse found in John chapter 6, I want to start from the beginning and read the whole passage with you. I know it's a bit of a long passage, but it's worth reading the whole thing in order to establish the full picture of what this bread represents. Now, before we begin with the reading of the passage, the context of the discourse is this. The day before, Jesus had fed the 5,000 with the fishes and the loaves. Many of the people there that day plotted to take Jesus by force and to make him king. But knowing this, Jesus disappeared and left to the other side of the lake. Now, finding him the very next day and not knowing how or when he arrived there, They asked Jesus, when did you come here? Jesus' response to them is where we will begin reading. John chapter 6 and starting in verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Here Jesus makes a distinction between food that perishes and food that endures to everlasting life. As I stated in the opening, many Christians equate the new covenant with liberties and indulgences of the flesh. 
oftentimes the debate over these liberties is literally about matters of eating and drinking. This amounts to making perishable food the substance of the new covenant regardless of which side of the debate you're on. But Jesus said clearly, do not do this. Do not labor for the food which perishes. But someone will say, yeah, but aren't we allowed to eat and drink? Isn't there a text that says Jesus cleansed all food? Okay then, eat. But stop pretending that eating and drinking perishable food equates to the gospel. Keep in mind, Jesus said this to a group of people who were inspired to make him king because they had just eaten the fishes and loaves that Jesus had provided to them the day before. No one is going to claim that they were not at liberty to eat the food that Jesus himself blessed and multiplied to give them. However, they erred not in eating, but in elevating the perishable blessing into the substance of their faith. Even when our blessings come from God, we need to remember that the blessings are themselves not God. Even if the liberties in the flesh that we enjoy are ordained by God, again, they are not God. If we are to be saved, there is a food and drink that we must consume that is not merely from God, but rather that is God. Later in the chapter, Jesus says exactly that. Verse 53, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Look, while I agree with Protestants in rejecting transubstantiation, or the teaching that the bread and the wine materially changes into the literal body and blood of Christ, the problem is that as Protestants, we have went to the other extreme in that we have devalued the metaphysical reality that is symbolized by the bread and the wine. While I do not believe the bread and the wine is literally the physical body and blood of Christ, I do believe that the theology behind the symbolism is so powerful that when we partake of communion, we should do so expecting the metaphysical realities of grace to flow to us as if we were eating the literal body and drinking the literal blood of Christ. By replacing the bread and the wine with music as the centerpiece of Christian worship, Protestants have not only de-emphasized their importance, they have also devalued the theology behind the symbolism of the bread and the wine. In doing so, I believe that we have also diminished the metaphysical realities that come along with making the bread and the wine the centerpiece of Christian worship. As a result, many young evangelicals today think a rock concert equates to Christian worship. But this was not so amongst the early Christians. Again, listen to whatever music you want. That's not my point. But don't try to make it the gospel. The apostles were not going about the Roman Empire with acoustic guitars singing cringe-worthy praise tunes. That's not what changed the world. What changed the world is what's symbolized by the bread and the wine. Again, before we get back to reading the, the text, let me reiterate this. Our language about the new covenant needs to be orientated towards God, not ourselves. For those who speak about the new covenant only in the context of anti-legalism or defending fleshly liberties, understand this. Unless the liberties you are engaging in can be equated to being God himself, and unless engaging in them can give you eternal life, then they do not equate to the gospel or to the new covenant. By all means, continue to resist legalism and continue to indulge in liberties, but do not equate them to the gospel or to the new covenant. The bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper equates to the gospel and the new covenant because both, according to Jesus' own words, represent him. God himself is the good news. 
And unless our language reflects that, then we are not talking about the gospel. We are merely talking about food that perishes. As a minister of the gospel, there is no point to labor to save people from legalism if the only food you offer them perishes with this life. Verse 28, Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. So do we believe in works? Yeah, yes, we do. And the first work that we need to do so that our faith is not dead is to believe in Jesus. Now this phrase, believe in him or some form of it, is the first of two phrases that we are going to see repeated in this discourse. Both of these phrases are essential to understanding the typological value of the bread as it relates to the New Covenant. The entire process of the New Covenant experience begins with this first phrase, meaning it begins with believing in Jesus. But what exactly about Jesus are we supposed to believe? Let's keep reading and we'll find out the answer to that question. Verse 30, Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe? What work will you do? Okay, so they're asking for a sign. They say, Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. In the story of the Exodus, the symbolism of bread is invoked twice. The first is at Passover when they ate the unleavened bread. Interestingly enough, the unleavened bread of Passover is literally what Jesus handed the disciples when he likened the bread to his body at the Lord's Supper. Now here in this story, the Jews are invoking the manna that their fathers ate from the wilderness, bread that scripture says came down from heaven. As we continue, we will see Jesus in Jesus' answer to them that he applies the manna from heaven, typologically speaking, to himself. Verse 32, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. In other words, Jesus is establishing here that the manna was just a type and that he is the antitype of the manna. The bread that their fathers ate in the wilderness did not give them eternal life. However, the bread that is Christ's body will give the ones who eat it eternal life. Verse 33, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. This is the second phrase that we're going to see repeated. The first is some form of believe in him, and the second is some form of he came down from heaven. As we read through the rest of this discourse, we'll count off how many times combined we see both of these phrases. Verse 34, Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me, one, shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Here is a negative form of the phrase that makes number two. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, number three, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him, number four, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven, number five. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven, number six? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. 
It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from God comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, number seven, has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, number eight, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven, number nine. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So there are nine times combined between the between the two phrases that we counted, plus the two before we started counting, which makes 11 times combined that we find these two phrases. The repetition of these two phrases forces us to conclude that they have something to tell us about the new covenant being conveyed through the symbolism of the bread. Now, there are another two phrases that are repeated throughout this passage that we did not highlight, and they are eternal life, and I will raise you up at the last day. So how does one secure for themselves a spot in the resurrection and obtain eternal life? Well, first and foremost, the answer to this question is found in decoding the new covenant symbolism of the bread, which of course is Christ's body. But how do we go from Christ's body, i.e. his flesh, to us obtaining to the resurrection and to eternal life? The answer is found in what we believe about the bread, meaning what we believe about Christ's flesh. Now, combining our two often repeated phrases that focus on believing and coming down from heaven, this is what we are to believe about Christ's flesh, that Jesus is God incarnate. In John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is what we call the Incarnation. In Matthew it says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Not a good man with us, not a righteous man with us, not an overcoming sin man with us. Rather, it says God with us. Yes, Jesus was good. Yes, he was righteous. And yes, he lived a sinless life. But he was more than just a mere man that happened to accomplish all these things. He was more than a man. He was more than a prophet. And he was more than the fake Christ that Aryan heretics have attempted to make him out to be. Jesus was and is truly God and truly man. This is what the bread of the new covenant represents, and this is what we call the incarnation. This is why the phrase came down from heaven is so important, because that is what the gospel based in the incarnation teaches us, that God came down to us. God the Word came down to us and became flesh, that Jesus could dwell with us. God the Holy Spirit comes down to us and literally dwells in us, as we are the new temple of the new covenant. And finally, God the Father, according to Revelation chapter 21, will himself come down to us and eternally dwell with us. Just listen to these beautiful words recorded by the Apostle John. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. Also there is no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, notice this, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. 
Now tell me this vision of future glory is not beautiful. The entire gospel, from start to finish, is this repeated theme of God coming down to us so that he can dwell with us. Again, the word came down to dwell with us. The Holy Spirit now dwells in us. And when it's all said and done, God the Father will dwell with us here on our newly remade earth. Now, this passage we just read from Revelation speaks of the tabernacle of God being with men. Now, let's compare this with a passage from Exodus about the original tabernacle of the Old Covenant. God speaking to Moses said, And let them make me a sanctuary or a tabernacle. Now, for what purpose? That I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. Now, there are two points to highlight from this text. The first is that the purpose of the tabernacle in the Old Covenant was not so man could save himself by his own works. Rather, it was to teach us through type in the Old Covenant what we would actually experience in reality under the New Covenant. And that is God has a huge desire to come down from heaven and to dwell with his people. Now, the second point that needs to be highlighted is this. Moses was instructed to make the tabernacle based on the pattern of another tabernacle that God showed Moses. So the question is, what and where is the original tabernacle that Moses was told to pattern his after? In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 1 we read, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and what? the earthly sanctuary. Now, why does Paul emphasize the obvious that the sanctuary or the temple of the Old Covenant was here on earth, if there is no such earth versus heaven comparison to be made? The reason is because there is a comparison to be made between an earthly and a heavenly sanctuary. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1 reads, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesties in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Could we say true as in the original that Moses was instructed to pattern his off of? Let's continue. Verse 4. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law who served the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. The sanctuary that Moses made was patterned after the original that exists in heaven. So am I saying there's a temple in heaven? Well, let's let the Bible speak for itself. Revelation chapter 11 verse 19. Then the temple of God was opened, where? In heaven, and the ark of the covenant was seen in his temple. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to do this now, but if you were to look up the dimensions of the most holy place in the earthly tabernacle, and you were to compare them with the dimensions of the new Jerusalem found in Revelation chapter 21, what you will find is that the two dimensions are exactly the same. What is obviously different is the scale, and of course one is a miniature type and the other is the reality being portrayed through the type. However, ultimately what this suggests is that the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven to this earth, that this city is the most holy place that was depicted in type by the most holy place of the earthly sanctuary. In fact, if you look at the Ark of the Covenant, which is the furniture that was in the most holy place, above the Ark was the mercy seat depicting two covering cherubs. This was a miniature scene of the throne of God in heaven, where on either side of the Father's throne stands two covering cherubs. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11 we read, 
But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Let me repeat those words here. There is a perfect tabernacle that exists that was not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Let's continue. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So in verse 12, we need to ask, where is this most holy place that Christ entered? We find the answer in verse 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, meaning the earthly temple, which are copies of the true, but into where? Heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now remember this, God told Moses to make him a sanctuary that he may dwell among his people. Then he told him to pattern it based on the true dwelling place of God in heaven. Now when we combine this with the scene we read about in Revelation chapter 21, where the new Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven, what we see is that the most holy place of the old covenant temple was actually a typological prophecy that the true and actual dwelling place of God the Father would one day be with us here on this earth. You know, people like to say that the earth is not the center of the universe, but one day, because of the gospel, it actually will be the center of the universe because God himself will dwell and rule from this very planet. Now, lest anyone thinks that we have veered off topic, going from the bread of the new covenant to talking about the most holy place and the new Jerusalem, the connection is this. From start to finish, the central theme of the gospel is that God comes down to us so that he can dwell with us. The plan of salvation starts with Jesus veiling his glory to dwell with the sinners, but it ends with the redeemed dwelling in the unveiled glory of God the Father. The bread which represents the incarnation, i.e. the word coming down from heaven and becoming flesh to dwell among us, This bread and what we believe about it, meaning what we believe about Christ's flesh, this is the very entry point into the gospel. As Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. We should also emphasize that the incarnation is the entry point into the one and only true gospel. However, the flip side is also true. Meaning, if what we believe about Christ is a heresy like Arianism, then what we enter into is a false gospel, which has zero chance of giving us eternal life. Now, in case anyone out there thinks I am overemphasizing the importance of the Incarnation, let's consider the words of the Apostle John. In 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 1, we read, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, But test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has what? Come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. John places the issue of the Incarnation, the very Incarnation that he himself described in the first chapter of his Gospel, he places it as the very factor that distinguishes those who are of God versus those who are of the spirit of the Antichrist. In light of this, it is not possible that I have overstated the importance of the Incarnation. The bread, we are told in John chapter 6, comes down from heaven. This means that in a gospel where the Incarnation is the foundation, God comes down to us to, one, dwell with us. That means we are accepted by Him. 
to, to save us from sin and death. When we believe and confess faith in Jesus as incarnate God, we receive the gift and the grace that is the bread of the new covenant. Just as it says of Abraham that he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, so too our belief in Christ as God incarnate grants us access to the same free gift of imputed righteousness. In contrast, every false gospel teaches in one form or another that man must elevate himself up to God through the righteous works of the flesh. Many striving to be Christians today and throughout history have believed that they cannot be saved without first possessing the merit to approach God in the hopes of, it, of obtaining His grace. Still others have taken it even further, believing that they cannot be saved without first obtaining to sinless perfection. Make no mistake about it, these false gospels are a denial of the Incarnation because they teach the exact opposite of what the Incarnation teaches us, which is that God comes down to us first, that we might know that we are accepted by Him, and that, may, that we may dwell with Him. Some of these same people speak of Jesus as if He were merely our example, not our Savior, not our second Adam, not the bread of life that came down from heaven, but a mere example of someone who, through overcoming sin, elevated himself up to God, and their reasoning is, if He did it, so can we. Let me tell you something about this Jesus. This is a false Christ and a false gospel, and let it be anathema. It is nothing more than a recycling of the heresy of Arianism that has plagued the church since the 4th century. I cannot tell you just how many miserable people, miserable because they're trying to perfect themselves in the flesh, who have mocked with scouring face the power of believing in Jesus for our salvation. They always add the word just in front of believe as they denounce the gospel claiming you can't be saved by just believing. Perhaps that might be true if what one believes in is something other than the word became flesh and dwelt among us. However, when who we believe in is God incarnate, then yes, we can be saved by just believing, as Jesus said. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. In closing, if we are to take part in this resurrection to eternal life, then we must first establish ourselves in the true gospel, which begins with a confession of faith in Jesus as God incarnate. For this truly is what the bread of the new covenant represents. Well, that will do it for today's episode of Typology and Prophecy. If you've continued listening up to this point, you are super awesome. Please leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think. If you did appreciate this, please hit the thumbs up. Thank you so much for joining me today and God bless.